Hi, and welcome to Snake Therapy. I'm Shira, and this is Aloran the Dumeril's Boa. It's been a long and widely held belief that snakes and other reptiles are not smart. The terms reptilian brain or lizard brain are even used to label parts of the human brain and are said to control purely instinctual and impulsive actions. But is it proven fact that snakes have no intelligence? And what is intelligence exactly? Well, today we're going to explore those topics in depth because neither are as straightforward or definitive as many would suggest. Researching this episode took me on a long and turbulent swim through the murky waters of reliable resources on the internet. The majority of the information I found was vague and largely unsupported by cited scientific evidence. Site after site regurgitated the same claims or ideas in slightly different packages or fonts, and per usual on the internet, there was a whole lot of garbage out there. The major issue though, is that there's been an extremely limited amount of actual scientific studies conducted specifically on snake intelligence at all. We just haven't prioritized the subject enough to really come to a clear and simple conclusion. And yet, there was enough information and behavioral evidence that combined with my own experience with snakes, inspired such a spark in me that this turned into rather a long episode. So I've decided to chop it into two parts. Today, we'll look at what science has to say about the reptilian brain, what humans define as intelligence, and look at snakes' behavior through the lens of two of four quotients we use to measure intelligence, the intelligence quotient, or IQ, and the social quotient, or SQ. In part two, we'll look at how snakes have measured up to the remaining two of four, adversity and emotional quotients. And we'll review the list of so-called most intelligent species of snakes to find out why certain species are on it and whether that list makes any sense at all. So without further ado, let's slither on into part one. century physician and neuroscientist Paul McLean developed a theory in the 1960s called the triune brain to describe the functionally distinct layers of the human brain, separating it into three parts, the reptilian brain, the mammalian brain, and the primate brain. His theory posited that the reptilian brain was composed of the brainstem and the basal ganglia, and that this part controlled our instincts and impulses, survival activities like breathing, heart rate, and the fight or flight response. His theory says that in humans, the reptilian brain is enveloped by the other two more sophisticated parts of the brain that control emotions and intelligence. This concept was hugely influential and is still widely spread as fact, but modern neuroscience now knows that this is an oversimplified and outdated method of mapping the brain and its functions. Science Direct even has an article claiming that McLean hadn't actually received the accreditation he should have to be counted as an expert on the subject, and that his background in the development was based from a religious standpoint. Renowned neuroscientist, psychologist, and professor Lisa Feldman Barrett, who authored a recent book on the subject, says, the problem with the triune brain story of evolution is that it's fundamentally not true. The brains of most vertebrates are made from the same types of neurons. It's the number of neurons and their arrangement that differ from species to species. She continues, the idea that our brains are essentially Russian dolls of diminishing complexity is a concept that's fairly easy to grasp. That's why this myth is so compelling. And indeed, the first pages of results when you Google reptilian or lizard brain utilize and employ this inaccurate theory as fact. Thanks to the triune theory, many scientists, vets, and common Joes with an internet platform proclaim that because the reptilian brain is all about instinct and survival, it doesn't learn well from experience. And that if a snake's brain is mostly made up of these parts, the conclusion is obviously that a snake can't learn and is therefore incapable of intelligence. The thing is, not only is there plenty of evidence to the contrary, a recent study found that the cells in the pallium, the white and gray matter of the brain, for both mammals and reptiles are the same, 
and the dorsal and ventricular ridge in reptiles is now thought to be the equivalent to the human neocortex, implementing the same function. The brains of reptiles also include the hippocampus and amygdala, which are responsible for producing and managing emotions. But we'll get into that side of things in part two. The other major problem in quantifying and analyzing the cognitive abilities of reptiles is that historically humans have prioritized researching intelligence in mammals with a staggering disparity of the number of studies between the two phyla. Of course, there are significant differences between mammals and reptiles, and not taking those into account when studying reptile cognition has its own set of problems. Many intelligence tests done on snakes have utilized the same means and methods as they did with the mammals. For example, mammals operate in a primarily visual world, but most snakes are more reliant on chemosensory and infrared radiation reception. So judging them based on their response to stimuli that doesn't fall under their dominant sense doesn't exactly seem like a fair or even scientific method of testing, does it? That's akin to judging a human's intelligence based upon their ability to smell as well as a dog. But before we get into what research has been conducted on the smarts of snakes, we should probably first define what smart actually means. The Oxford Dictionary defines intelligence as the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills. Another common definition is the ability to learn from experience to adapt to, shape, and select environments, and to solve problems and make decisions benefiting the actor. Psychology defines intelligence further into four quotients. Intelligence quotient, or IQ, social quotient, or SQ, adversity quotient, or AQ, and emotional quotient, or EQ. Additionally, humans often differentiate between intelligence and wisdom. We say that older people are wiser because they have more experience, but younger people are more often adaptable and capable of retaining new information. Interestingly, we know that snakes create new neurons in their brains without restriction throughout their entire lives, while the jury's still out on whether humans can. So it seems like even in terms of defining intelligence, it's not exactly a straightforward answer. That being said, let's talk about what we have observed in snakes that fall under the various definitions of intelligence. IQ is measured in terms of comprehension. For humans, we have standardized assessments to test the ability to solve mathematical equations, memorize things, identify patterns, and recall lessons. Problem-solving capabilities would also fall under IQ. Now, we haven't figured out how to test whether or not a snake can solve mathematical problems, but we absolutely have observed that snakes possess recall and the ability to learn from experience. They remember territorial boundaries, specific hiding spots they return to again and again, and they even recognize their owners, using their tongues to pull in chemical indicators to the Jacobson's organ, which informs their brain about their surroundings and whether something is recognizable or unfamiliar, threatening or not. A great example showing that snakes are capable of recall and learning is animal behaviorist Lori Torini's practice of using what she calls target training for her snakes. She shows them certain visual cues to signal that it's feeding time. And even though vision is not their primary sense, her results have demonstrated that snakes learn and remember what those cues mean. When she showed them certain targets, she rewarded them with a meal. They eventually learned that when they saw this target, it was food time, and they instantly went into a feeding response. Not only did this reduce the snake's inclination to act in a feeding response without the presence of the target, meaning less chance of mistaking a human hand for food, but it also allowed her to train them to come out of their enclosures when she wanted them to without having to do it manually. For example, getting them to voluntarily get onto a scale so she can check their weight. She's also advocated the use of puzzle toys, just like those used for dogs, to hide food in for captive snakes to give them cognitive stimulation, which they have solved in order to acquire the prey item. 
And if you've watched my episode about snake skills as a skate artist, you know that snakes demonstrate clear problem solving capabilities with their uncanny knack of finding ways out of their enclosures. Snakes have been observed avoiding areas they remembered were dangerous, recognizing harmful versus palatable substances, and remembering spatial orientation. Now, when put in a maze made for a rat with visual markers to recall, snakes didn't score so well on decreasing the time it took them to find their way out of the maze. But when tested in an enclosed space that had chemical markers as cues to remember, their speed in solving the puzzle went up remarkably. Some snakes are able to outsmart their prey in ways it would be very hard to say is unintelligent. For example, hiding in a rat trap because they learned that their prey would come right to them. Remember, it's a widely held belief that snakes act on instinct rather than intelligence, but rat traps are not natural parts of the environment. And yet, this guy figured out where he could go in order to do the least amount of work to get a meal. Remember that second definition of intelligence? King cobras and rattlesnakes have been observed manipulating their surroundings to benefit their goals. For example, collecting items to create a nest for their young, or moving branches out of the way in order to facilitate hunting their prey more efficiently. As for adaptation, over the 128 million years snakes have been on this planet, they've adapted in so many ways as to allow them to exist in almost every type of habitat on Earth. They also display skills like mimicry, not only in their evolutionary biology, but also in their behavior. Some non-venomous species have evolved Batesian mimicry, meaning they changed their appearance over time to take on attributes of venomous species in order to deter possible predators. Sure, that's evolution over millennia, but what about behavioral mimicry? This is found across a multitude of snake species, for example, changing the shape of their bodies or mannerisms in order to convince a predator that it's more dangerous than it is. They can even fake behavior, like the hognose snake, who will literally flop on its back and stick out its tongue and pretend to be dead when it's threatened. They had to think about it in order to develop those skills and abilities that became dominant behavioral traits to the species, right? I mean, the first time that worked for them, was that truly just instinct? Did they not have to observe what worked for the other snake and learn how to emulate it? The social quotient refers to one's ability to interact and communicate with others with empathy and assertiveness. This includes a person's ability to build a network of friends and maintain it over a long period of time. Now, even I've told you that most snakes are not social by nature. However, there are several species that routinely exhibit social relationships. One study conducted by Morgan Skinner, a doctoral candidate in behavioral ecology, along with his advisor, Noam Miller, a comparative psychologist, found that garter snakes not only sought each other out, but that they sought out specific individuals in particular and repeatedly. And this wasn't for reproduction, but assumedly because, well, they just liked each other. Even when these snakes were removed from one environment and put in a different one where any and all memorable chemical cues were eliminated, the same snakes sought each other out again and likewise did not engage with the individuals they had previously avoided. Another study showed that heart rates of wild-caught snakes were substantially reduced when they were put in a container with another snake, as opposed to when they were in the container alone or with a rope as a substitute, indicating that social relationships helped calm their nervous system when under stress. Did those scientists really believe that a snake would think a rope is another snake? I mean, really? A recent study found that juvenile and pregnant female timber rattlesnakes seem to prefer to cuddle up with close relatives. Rattlesnakes also create and reuse nests and dens to keep their babies safe, showing that they recognize and nurture their offspring beyond birth. This behavior is something we generally regard as a sign of behavioral intelligence in mammals. Pretty clearly indicates 
that snakes do possess qualities of SQ. What about social interactions with humans? I certainly have unique relationships with each one of my snakes. Once trust was established, they all recognize me as safe, as their caretaker, and even seek out touch and interaction with me of their own accord. Alternately, some snakes might become nervous or defensive around people whose scent they don't recognize, or if they sense that a person is uncomfortable about them. This is probably less about social cues than it is instinct and self-preservation, because they can detect stress hormones a person is emitting and sense it might mean danger for them. But snakes can and do show behavior that suggests their social intelligence goes beyond even their own kind. Something that's incredibly important to note about our general disregard for the sentience of reptiles is that it can easily have potentially toxic effects on animal welfare and captive husbandry. If we consider them to be unthinking, unfeeling creatures, we're much more likely to take their experience and welfare needs for granted than we would our pet mammals. Unfortunately, that can then be used as a weapon to promote legislation banning the practice of keeping reptiles as pets altogether. Whether we're talking about snakes or humans, intelligence is not black or white, nor simply present or absent. Intelligence is complex and multifaceted, and each animal's brain is unique. Just as a human's intelligence is based on and developed by experience, stimulation, and a multitude of other factors from genes to diet, the same goes for snakes. We shouldn't underestimate these animals, and one of the most beautiful and therapeutic parts about working with them is taking the time and patience to get to know them and to watch them develop their brains and personalities. Whether or not we will ever know what they're thinking is less important than knowing that they have demonstrated intelligence and do have the capacity for thought. So the key here is for us to get better at cultivating empathy towards these amazing creatures, even if we don't fully understand them. I'm pretty sure that folks will have a lot to say in response to what I've shared here today. So please let me know your thoughts in the comments, share your experiences or insights into what we've gone through so far. Let's just make sure to keep it constructive and kind. But there's a lot more to go through still, so don't forget to subscribe and hit those buttons and make sure you tune in for part two of the Snake Intelligence series. Next time, we'll be looking at whether snakes show characteristics of the other two quotients of intelligence, adversity and emotional, which I found fascinating to explore. Even people in the reptile community often say without hesitation that snakes have zero emotional capabilities. But is it really fact, or are we just assuming based on a lack of concrete information? Stay tuned for the next installment to find out. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Shira, and this is O'Lauren, and we'll see you next time for more snake therapy.